Good morning, everybody. I understand and thank Warren, uh, but I understand his desire that I get on with it, but we're not in chapter two. <laughs> we're only in chapter one. And, uh, which, as you recall, chapter one is a long chapter, but um, uh, we've got quite a few verses to read this morning, beginning in verse five and going through verse 25. So let's jump uh, right into it. We took note in our introduction to the Gospel of Luke, the many details and events that the historian Luke included in his gospel that the other gospel writers omitted. The birth narratives uh, related to the birth of John the Baptist and then of uh, our Lord Jesus uh, found in the first two of these rather long chapters of the Gospel of Luke are perhaps the most notable example of that and the most beloved. Uh, we began our study of them this morning with Luke's simple setting of the stage in verse 5 of chapter 1. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zacharias. Uh, two men, one very much a public figure, the other an unknown, but it was not as if Zacharias was unimportant. He was a Jew and a priest of the Lord God, therefore he was a member of the covenant community of Israel, God's chosen people. And so we read the passage, in the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zacharias of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. They were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. Now it happened that while he was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division, according to the custom of the priestly office, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were in prayer outside at the hour of the incense offering. And an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing to the right of the altar of incense. Zacharias was troubled when he saw the angel, and fear gripped him. But the angel said to him, do not be afraid, Zacharias, for your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you will give him the name John. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be, he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. And he will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zacharias said to the angel, How will I know this for certain? For I am an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. The angel answered and said to him, I am Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you shall be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place, because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their proper time. The people were waiting for Zacharias and were wondering at his delay in the temple. But when he came out, he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple, and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. When the days of his priestly service were ended, he went back home, 
After these days, Elizabeth, his wife, became pregnant, and she kept herself in seclusion for five months, saying, This is the way the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked with favor upon me to take away my disgrace among men. Well, this is a chapter of history uh, we're familiar with. Uh, we might choose to call this part one. Uh, but of course, there were many chapters that preceded it, only it had been so long since God had actually broken into history in such a way as this. Zacharias and Elizabeth were part of a faith community whose origin stretched back for millennia. They were united by a covenant relationship, a, a common canon of scripture, and a common history uh, marked by remarkable events, claims of supernatural triumphs, national preeminence, but then astounding failures, both personal and corporate. And when we come to the end of this very long first chapter in verse 78 of Luke chapter 1, Zacharias himself will prophesy that the sunrise from on high will visit us to shine upon those who sit in darkness and the shadow of death. It had indeed been dark the years before this. The last word of a prophet that had come to the nation Israel had been 400 years prior. Uh, the fourth and final chapter of the prophet uh, Malachi's oracle promised all who revered the name of God that a day was coming when the Son of Righteousness would rise with healing in His wings and the people would go forth and skip about like calves from the stall. And the Lord would send them Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He would restore the hearts of the faithful before the coming of the Lord. He would be the forerunner to Messiah. But that had been the last word from God for now four centuries. And for the faithful of Israel, that promise must have seemed as if it would never be fulfilled. But these faithful's hearts would soon feel the warmth of God's light and all its brilliance as even then God's plan from ages past was entering countdown. It was the fullness of of the time. Now, if we uh, elevate our perspective to these first two chapters of Luke, we see there is a distinct parallel, parallelism in them. First come God's promises made to humble recipients and all out of proportion to the breathtaking prospects. Then comes their fulfillment and Luke chronicles both in good detail. He describes how in both instances, the saving events were initiated by the action of God. Likewise, in both, the messenger sent to proclaim the good news is the angel Gabriel. And in both, he offers a confirming sign that the promises are certain. One concerns the birth of the forerunner, the other the birth of Messiah himself. And they are woven together by the interchange between Mary, the mother of Jesus, and Elizabeth, whose miraculous conception foreshadows her own, and both of whose progeny will put on display levels of greatness never seen before and never seen since. These parallel events took place, Luke writes, in the days of Herod, king of Judea. Uh, this was Herod the first, or, or Herod the Great. He actually was a king in the sense that Rome had given him that title and a realm to rule, and that realm was the ancient land of the Jews. He had taken the assignment and run with it. Uh, ruthlessly enlarging his borders, making enemies along the way, and few friends. An Edomite by descent, he claimed to be a Jew by religion, 
And as part of an extensive building program, the imposing temple of the Jews was his most impressive accomplishment. But it did little to endear him to his subjects who saw through his political maneuvering and were well aware of the pagan temples that he had also constructed. Uh, this Herod was the Herod identified in Matthew chapter 2 as the jealous king who sought to deceive the Magi into revealing the birthplace of the true king of the Jews, born in Bethlehem, and perceived by Herod as such a threat that he ordered the slaughter of all the male infants born near that time in Bethlehem and vicinity. The Herod that appears later in our Gospels was his youngest son, uh, Herod uh, the Tetrarch, or Herod Antipas. But it was during the reign of Herod the Great that a simple country priest named Zacharias made his appearance at the temple in Jerusalem. Luke tells us he was of the division of Abijah. Now this reflects uh, the history of the priesthood because during David's reign, he had organized the priests into 24 divisions. This is recorded in 1 Chronicles 24. And Abijah was the eighth in the order of those divisions. Zacharias' wife, Elizabeth, was herself the daughter of a priest. So their marriage constituted something of a double blessing. And Luke describes how their conduct reflected their heritage. They were righteous in the sight of God, that being defined as walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. In other words, they were what we would today call a godly couple. And that made it all the more mystifying that they had been unable to have children. Uh, when we meet them, not only is Elizabeth counted as barren, uh, Luke adds that they were advanced in years. But it was widely held that children were the blessings God bestowed on those who followed him faithfully. So it had to have been a great trial in their lives and a source of unwanted shame. And now there was no hope for them. As one of the commentators wrote, the spotted, worn hands of this righteous couple would never hold a child of their own. And beginning in verse 8, Luke sets the scene for the miracle that will not only bring great and unexpected joy for Zacharias and Elizabeth, but also for the people of God as a whole. Each of the 24 divisions of the priests were responsible for one week service at the temple in Jerusalem twice a year, as well as at the major festivals. And one of the duties was the offering of incense at the morning and evening sacrifices. And because there were so many uh, priests, there were some estimated that between 18 and 20,000 priests at this time, no one priest was allowed the privilege of offering incense more than once in his lifetime, and many never received uh, the honor. And so when we read that Zacharias was chosen by Lot on this day to assume that service in the temple, we must understand that it was almost certainly one of the greatest privileges of his life, if not the greatest. Yet his day would unfold in a manner he never could have imagined. These Old Testament rituals involving the priestly duties and altars and the ceremonies, they're a bit alien uh, to people like us, most of us typical 21st century Gentile believers. So some explanation is in order. The offering of incense, many of you are very familiar with this, but the offering of incense was symbolic for the prayers of God's people, continually offered to show sincerity and 
faith that the Lord was still the God of Israel and still faithful to his promises. It was when the priests, at this time, it was when the priests approached most closely to the veil, uh, separating the, uh, the holy place from the holy of holies. Zacharias would have entered into the holy place accompanied by other priests, but then they would have retired, leaving him alone to carry the incense to the burning altar. And so there was before him the intricately embroidered curtain of the Holy of Holies with the cherubim woven in beautiful colors. On his left was the table of showbread, on his right the golden candlestick. Directly in front was the gold-plated altar of incense. And so the chosen priests would place the incense upon the altar and then prostrate himself in prayer before it. We know this from the Targum. It's recorded. We know what they did. Mention of the worshipers outside the inner sanctuary in verse 10 serves not only to underscore the sanctity of the moment, but also to prepare us for their subsequent puzzlement at the delay. Uh, but the Lord had chosen the moment intentionally to reveal his plans to break into their world and answer their prayers. Suddenly, Zacharias's already dramatic day was turned on its head when a supernatural being appeared before him, standing just to his right. Luke describes him as an angel of the Lord, and upon seeing the angel, Zacharias was gripped with fear. The serenity of his priestly service was jolted into awful wonder. The angel spoke first, understandably advising Zacharias to not be afraid. I think there's significance to that. Uh, this physical world is not all there is. It's easy to think that it is. It's all we see, but it's not all there is. But there is an as yet unseen world inhabited by supernatural beings over whom the Lord God reigns supreme. Yet on those rare occasions when God, uh, according to his perfect plan, allows that realm to break into our own, the response is always a kind of terror. And God mercifully encourages the earthbound to not fear, but rather have faith. This was to be a great test of faith for Zacharias. The angelic realm is real, and the elect angels who serve as God's ministers are avidly interested in the outworking of God's kingdom. And that's indicated by the second thing the angel says, your petition has been heard. The angel had come to announce to Zacharias that his participation this day was not random, despite the fact he had been chosen by lot, and not simply another in a series of offerings and prayers, but his petition was one that had been heard by God in a history-altering, eschatological way. And so at this point, uh, the question that we have to ask is what specific petition of Zacharias had been heard by God in this way? That's the question. Your petition has been heard. What petition? Luke's narrative might lead us to believe that Zacharias had boldly dared to use the holy occasion to beseech the Lord again for a child to be born to Elizabeth and him. Uh, the dialogue can be read in that way. Your petition has been heard and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son. But there are good reasons to dismiss that idea. 
Uh, we've already been told Elizabeth was barren and also that they were advanced in years, meaning they were too old to have children. And it's likely, I think it's beyond doubt that this man and his wife had ceased years ago asking the Lord for a child and had simply come to accept God's answer. There's also, though, the, the sanctity of the moment itself to consider. Zacharias was a priest. And at this moment, he was carrying out his priestly role in a most significant fashion. If, and if there was ever a moment uh, to be focused on the very essence of the service that the Lord had laid upon him, it was that moment. It's extremely unlikely he would have taken the occasion to focus on, personal, on a personal request or, that, or even that God would have sent his angel in order to announce what would turn out to be only the secondary part of his message. The significance of the announcement that the two would now have a son is to be found in who that son would be. That is... And what the angel goes on to say, John would be great in the sight of the Lord and spirit-filled from the moment of his conception. He would play a mighty role in preparing the people of God for the promised Messiah. Zacharias had presented a petition to the Lord in harmony with the sacrifice accompanying his service. It was for the redemption of of God's people at last for the coming of Messiah and the long-awaited era of salvation. He could not have dreamed that the miracle of a son born to Elizabeth would be the beginning of the Lord's response of grace. She would bear, bear a son, the angel said, and they would call his name John, Johannes, in Hebrew, the name for God combined with the name for uh, grace, Hanan, to be gracious. That the child was named before his birth was yet another indicator that God had sovereignly responded in grace to Israel's ages-long prayer for a Redeemer. And it was a reminder that his grace toward his people is never far away, but is always ready to be revealed according to his good pleasure. Well, now I want to pause here just for a moment to, to notice something. Uh, I labeled this section of our passage, if we have the outline, the angel Gabriel startling good news. And that was purposeful. Gabriel had brought good news. Uh, if you look ahead to verse 19, you find him describing and declaring that explicitly, I have been sent to speak to you and bring you this good news. This announcement was good news. And what do we normally do when we receive good news? We rejoice. Uh, good news is welcome. No matter what other things may be going on in our lives, no matter the sense of dread we have, may have had before, for one reason or another, when good news comes, we rejoice. And I know you know that because a lot of you have had some good news after some bad news. And this is another of Luke's themes, uh, this note of joy that accompanies the good news of a Redeemer. And we see it now in the angel's message in verse 14. You will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth. The news that Zacharias and Elizabeth were to have a son was a cause for great joy, of course, for uh, for the two of them, but who that son would turn out to be, which the angel goes on to describe in the following verses, the forerunner to the Messiah, well, that would cause many to rejoice. And only a short time 
uh, other angels will appear to a, a group of shepherds, uh, keeping watch over their flock by night, uh, carrying the now familiar message, do not be afraid. Behold, I bring you good news of great joy, which will be for all the people. What the Lord has done for his people in the Lord Jesus Christ is reason for great joy. And I, it, it goes without saying, too often Christian people are not filled with that joy. So I'm not reprimanding you, I'm just reminding us uh, what he has done for us is, is reason for us to be joyful people. Today, you and I look back at those events portrayed in the gospel and we rejoice. Uh, but Zacchaeus and the worshipers gathered even then outside this inner sanctuary had very much looked forward uh, to these events. The promised Messiah was to come to them one day and they knew before him the forerunner in the spirit and power of Elijah would precede him to prepare the way. So it's only natural that the angel would foretell that many would rejoice at his birth. What he literally said was they will rejoice at his coming. God had promised to send him and now he was coming to them amazingly in the person of this miracle baby who is now described in verse 15 as the one who will be great in the sight of the Lord. And you can feel the sense of wonder and excitement even as the angel recites the attributes of John's greatness. He will drink no wine or liquor. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit prenatal. He will turn the sons of Israel back to the Lord. He will be the promised forerunner preparing the way for Messiah. He will, he will, he will. There's a breathlessness in the angel's announcement. That he will be great reminds us first of what the Lord Jesus will one day say about him. Luke records it in chapter 7. I say to you, among those born of women, there is no one greater than John. But it also sets him in relief against King Herod, introduced by Luke at the start uh, a cruel despot, yet also an accomplished one, and one who, because of his accomplishments, would become known as Herod the Great. But the angel had come down from heaven, and he had come down from heaven. That's, that's significant. And he understood true greatness. True greatness was not found in the comparatively trivial power Herod wielded, or the or his ruthless rule, or the monuments he erected for his own glory. True greatness was what a man revealed of himself in the sight of the Lord. And this promised one would be great in his sight. And we're reminded surely of what God had advised Samuel centuries before this when he identified the young David as the successor uh, to King Saul, uh, God sees not as man sees, for man looks at the outward appearance, but God looks at the heart. Now here, the angel reveals the greatness of John the Baptist to his future father. He will drink no wine or liquor. Uh, some have seen this and, and read this and thought, well, John must have been a Nazarite, the Old Testament category uh, that some of you know about but don't, don't, don't want to spend time now to uh, go into that. But we have no evidence from his future life that he displayed all the characteristics of a Nazarite, for example, that he didn't cut his hair. It's better to see this in contrast to the next clause, that he will be filled with the Spirit, uh, bringing to mind, I hope, what uh, Paul would later write in Ephesians 5, 18, do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. Uh, this, the, 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 this promised son would anticipate that. 
his life would be marked by unprecedented divine power. He would be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb. Now, that expression indicates divine choice, uh, certainly, uh, but also care of a person from his very birth. Before he was even born, the hand of God was on John to prepare him for his work. He would be God's servant in the manner of an Old Testament prophet like Jeremiah, who began his prophetic career according to Jeremiah chapter 1, verse 5, with the pronouncement of the Lord, announcing, Before I formed you, Jeremiah, in the womb, I knew you. And before you were born, I consecrated you. That kind of divine election to special service did not end with John the Baptist, the Apostle Paul, albeit in, in a different way slightly, received God's plan for him uh, from the womb. If you remember Dan's sermon just last Sunday out of uh, Galatians 1.15, Saul of Tarsus had been set apart, he said, even from my mother's womb, and God called me through his grace, Paul said, to reveal his son in him that he might preach him among the Gentiles. In the same way, God would equip John the Baptist for the mission to which he was born. And in verse 16, the angel describes that mission in terms reminiscent of an Old Testament prophet. He will turn many of the sons of Israel back to the Lord their God. It is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. It is he who will, says the angel. The pronouncement carries with it the tenor of something previously known and anticipated. This son Elizabeth will bear will be the fulfillment of a figure prophesied beforehand and to whom you and faithful Israel have awaited. He will be the one who in the spirit and power of Elijah will bring about the great promised revival. Uh, the angel quotes even, note, from that last prophecy of Malachi 4 in which the Lord promised, Behold, I'm going to send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and terrible day of the Lord. He will restore the hearts of the fathers and the hearts of the children. Everybody knew Elijah. Nobody could forget this man. He was the epitome of of boldness and righteous zeal. He had uh, the courage to denounce the apostasy of the people of his time, and he stared down the pagan prophets of Baal on Mount Carmel, and God had brought fire down from heaven on his behalf. Uh, John's ministry would be of the same character. Now, was John actually Elijah? You know the answer to that. He's not identified as such. And later, after he had demonstrated this kind of similar kinship to Elijah, he would be asked directly, are you Elijah? And respond truthfully, I am not. But he would be inspired with the same spiritual power and fervor of Elijah. Jesus would even refer to him as Elijah. In Matthew 17, he explained to Peter, James, and John after the transfiguration, Elijah is coming, he said, and will restore all things. But I say to you that Elijah already came, and they did not recognize him, but did to him whatever they wished. So also the Son of Man is going to suffer at their hands. Then the disciples understood that he had spoken to them about John the Baptist. And so the angel's pronouncement to Zacharias is that he will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah 
to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient uh, to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Malachi's prophecy had also referenced fathers and their children. What's he saying? He seems to be saying that John's ministry of calling Israel to repentance will inevitably result in changed hearts. And changed hearts result in changed relationships. And the most fundamental environment in which that change is revealed is the home. And so you think about, you look back on Malachi's prophecy and you think that there is a nation whose spiritual infidelities had destroyed the family structure. And so it's in Malachi chapter 2 uh, that we find that verse that has echoed through the centuries. I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. And so we have here in our 16th and 17 ver verses the angel explaining to Zacharias the mission that would be his sons to turn the nation back, to turn their hearts, to restore their hearts, all necessary. And now the angel completes the prophecy to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. And in verse 18, the spotlight returns to Zacharias. Alone in the sanctuary, with no one to witness this almost out-of-body experience with the angel and with the smoke of the incense wafting about him, we can, he can only revert to the default mechanism of all of us mortals wait a minute, can this actually be happening to me? Perhaps he blinked his eyes over and over again, and the angel remained in front of him. And then the shock of the pronouncement sunk, sunk in, and mortal reality gave way to unbelief. Like Abraham before him, and Sarah before him. Zacharias dares to ask the question, how will I know this for certain? Because I'm an old man, and my wife is advanced in years. Zacharias needed a sign of some kind to convince him that such a thing could actually happen. And we may debate the relative weakness of Zacharias's faith. That is, that in such a circumstance, he could express, express such doubt, incredulity, puzzlement, and express this desire for an explanation that could strengthen his acceptance of this remarkable revelation. The, the commentators, you read them, they almost unanimously condemn Zacharias for his unbelief. They say he had the advantage over Abraham and Sarah because he had their example. Uh, he had the examples of Manoah and his barren wife and the miraculous birth of Samson and of barren Hannah and the gift that the son Samuel was to her, a miracle child. He was a priest of God. He was in the temple. A supernatural being was even then in his presence. The circumstances, all these things, and yet Zacharias wavered in his faith, balked in accepting the unbelievable. So I struggled with this. But here is the clincher, I think, in judging Zacharias' faith. It is that the angel who, as he says, stands in the presence of God, 
condemns his unbelief. He answers to him, I am Gabriel. This is verse 19. I am Gabriel who stands in the presence of God, and I have been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you shall be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place, because you did not believe my words, which will be fulfilled in their proper time. This was the angel Gabriel. He is one of only two angels known by name in the Bible. His name means man of God, and this was not his first appearance into human history, nor was it to be his last. Five centuries prior, he had entered Daniel's life with a message from God concerning the future. And now with Zacharias, his concern is to reveal the future. And a short time later, he'll be sent by God to a city in Galilee called Nazareth to greet a young virgin named Mary and announce her glorious future as well. In the Bible, the elect angels are God's messengers. That's what the word angelus means. Uh, Gabriel is an especially important one, and that he stands in the presence of God is an indicator of his authority and of the solemnity of the occasion. God had sent him specifically to announce good news. And so Zacharias, paralyzed doubt, has to be seen, as Leon Morris has suggested, in the light of God's condescension in sending such a messenger with such a message to reject him was serious and it would have its consequences. Zacharias would get his sign all right, though not the kind of sign he wanted. Well, it was a mild rebuke considering the gravity of the situation, but it also served a dual purpose, for it would reveal to the awaiting worshipers that something unusual had happened without actually revealing the content of the revelation made. So the scene shifts in the final verses to the crowd of worshipers waiting outside in the outer court of the temple. It did not take long to burn the incense, and normally the priest who undertook the duty did not linger uh, for fear he'd be accused of presumption to stay in there that long. He would have then been joined by the other priests in pronouncing a benediction upon the people. So when Zacharias finally emerged and was unable to speak, they knew something had happened, and by the signs he made to them, they were able to conclude he had seen a vision of some kind. And then Luke brings the episode to an end. It feels like something like a denouement. The days of his service come to an end. He and Elizabeth return home, and afterwards she became pregnant. Uh, the impossible was possible. And the angel will soon explain to Mary, nothing will be impossible with the Lord. God's promises never fail. Elizabeth and Zacharias discovered that. Why she kept herself in seclusion uh, was probably because she wanted to wait until there was visible evidence. So, but the stage was now set. What a wonderful slice of salvation history this is. In Elizabeth's womb was the forerunner to the Messiah, uh, promised in ages past, and filled with the Spirit of God. He would soon fulfill his role. We won't come to it for yet a few more lessons, but Zacharias's song of prophecy in the final verses of chapter 1, reveals his own newfound conviction. He would hold the miracle baby in his hands, arms, and he could confidently declare, you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go on before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give to the people the knowledge of salvation by the forgiveness of their sins. Forgiveness and salvation realized. And the angelic beings would look down with wonder from above. Let's pray. 
Father, thank you for the recording of this uh, amazing piece of salvation history that reminds us that nothing is impossible with you, that you remain true to your promises. Uh, we are mindful that we are the recipients of a miraculous salvation, uh, one worth proclaiming uh, to this unbelieving world. We pray you'd give us grace to be faithful in that. In Jesus' name, amen.